It's bizarre to think that in only four years, the same artist who put out Transparent Allergy would be making a song like this. This is Silence by Nabuna and Sarah Furukawa. It was made as the theme for the Spice and Love VR game in Japan, and is a beautiful guitar ballad that I can only describe as enchanting. Sarah's angelic vocals echo into this empty void as Nabuna provides this gentle melody on his acoustic guitar, with light piano keys carefully woven in and out. It creates this incredible level of immersion that truly pulls you out of the world. It's certainly an insane departure from the high-energy synths and hard-hitting instrumentals he was so well-known for in the Vocaloid community, but more than anything else, it quickly makes you realize how much the Nabuna we knew eight years ago has grown. This change in direction in his sound was something we actually saw during the beginning of his last album as a Vocaloid producer, with 2016's Getsu Oadui Teiru. Compared to 2015's Hanato Mizu Ame Saishu Densha, it's far more relaxed and far less focused on coming off as dynamic on every track. The album, for example, is filled with these simple piano melodies that would later become a key centerpiece of Yoroshiko's projects. Likewise, the lead singles from this album, like Snow White and Flowers Made the Fall, had a much higher focus on atmosphere and letting the vocals take the center stage instead of the melodies. The synths and electronics that had been such a large part of Nabuna's rise of fame were now nowhere to be found. Instead, the tracks were much more stripped back. And all of these individual pieces would largely become the direction he would take Yoroshika when he met Sui that same year. I feel like in situations like this, the most natural thing to ask yourself is, what do you prefer? Do you like the Nabuna who makes these bold electronic rock fusions, or do you like the Yoroshika Nabuna who decided to make these beautiful rock ballads instead? Personally, I don't really have a preference because I think they both have their own merits. I might love a song like Hibernation for the light floaty strings that Nabuna provides, as Sui seems to perfectly hover over them. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, I might love a song like Dawn and Firefly for how impactful the strings felt. In my eyes, it's like trying to compare Kenji Yonizu with Hachi. They're so drastically different artists now that it doesn't seem fair to compare them. I think it just makes me more grateful that Nabuna didn't feel pressure to keep making the same kind of music after he left Vocaloid. Okay, so this is going to come off as a little controversial. So you all know I love Vocaloid, and I'm a complete nerd when it comes to tuning as well. Heck, I even made a whole video on it a little while back. But I do believe there's a certain merit that real voices bring to music that Vocaloid has yet to achieve. And I think Sui really shows that. While Nabuna is undeniably the mastermind behind Yoroshika, I think it would be a mistake to write off Sui as a simple tool that Nabuna is using to meet his ends. For example, Say It is probably my favorite track that Nabuna has ever composed. The guitar riff is unbelievably infectious. The sudden chimes that go off during the chorus, simply put, are mesmerizing. It's also just a wonderfully well-written song with some truly poetic verses. But I think half the reason I keep coming back to this song is because of Sui. There is so much passion in her delivery. The way she can simply go from whispering during the pre-chorus to straight out belting only a few moments later is just downright impressive. But that's not what really sold me. It was more of the small details she gives in her performance. It's the way that she can perfectly hold that last motul towards the end of the song. Or the way every time she goes ah during the chorus, it makes time stop. It's the small stuff like that, that you never really notice, that gives these tracks so much life and shows her talent as a singer. I ask you, would a song like Compulsive Bomber really have the same impact if she didn't hold out the last word of each line during the chorus? Nabuna has acknowledged how Sui has grown him as an artist too. In an interview in 2019, he talked about how his arrangement with Sui started as a simple business relationship to allow Nabuna to make music outside of Vocaloid. Now he views her as his legitimate partner and has grown attached to the human expression that Yoroshika brings to his sound. That was a direct result, he says, of the honest empathy or strong emotional focus Sui has brought with her vocals. And with that bond, Yoroshika has grown into one of Japan's most popular groups in recent history. Say it, Just a Sunny Day For You, That's Why I Gave Up On Music, they are all songs that have hit millions of views on YouTube, and have had a widespread influence on Japan's current youth. Just a Sunny Day For You, for example, became a massive hit on TikTok over in Japan. And while I've never been a big fan of the app personally, it regardless gives you an idea of the widespread impact the group has had in recent years. And I think that really speaks to the relatability of Nabuna's writing. Throughout his whole career, Nabuna has never written anything so outlandish that it could only exist in a world of fiction. <clears throat> okay, besides that, there's always a sense of realism and simplicity to what he writes. Whether it's his featureless characters or the lyrics that constantly focus on the hardships of relationships. 
It's not hard to see why teenagers would find it so easy to put themselves in the shoes of the characters he writes about in his songs. If you look at his music out of context or just a brief overview of his songs, it may come off as repetitive or have very little in variety of theme. I mean, it's constantly about broken relationships and exploring the nature of unrequited love. But I would never once say that once you've heard one song by Nabuna, you've heard them all. Because there is so much detail that goes into a Yoroshika track. I can't think of any example that emphasizes this more than their albums that came out last year, Alma and The Reason I Gave Up On Music. If I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I won't say that I love these albums equally, but in terms of writing, it was a real treat to deep dive into both. Elma and The Reason I Gave Up On Music are an interwoven story, focusing on the story of the two protagonists, Amy and Elma, and the growth of their relationship after meeting in a simple coffee shop on a rainy day. In a sense, they're complete opposites. Elma is a reserved and timid young woman, but is kind and open-minded, essentially a normal young girl. While Amy is outgoing and focused, he dreams of becoming a musician and knows the hardships that come with such an ambitious dream, constantly living on his own and only living on the bare minimum but they form a budding relationship through music and eventually fall in love with each other, as they completely change each other's perspective on life, only to be met with tragedy as Amy becomes terminally ill, and leaves Elma to spend the final moments of his life alone, unable to make her deal with the weight of watching someone you love die, leaving only a paper trail for her to find the remaining items he possessed before taking his own life, as Elma resolves to become a musician to tell the story of the one she loved. It's an interesting narrative to say the least, because while Alba focuses on an artist who is just gaining the passion to write for the first time, the reason I gave up on music as well focused on an artist who was at the end of their road. And I don't think Nabuna needed to go this far when making these albums. But I do think what makes Nabuna unique as an artist is that he cares enough about what he does to create a whole narrative for just these characters. To the point he released a 50 page diary that came with the limited edition of Alma telling this whole story. He's more of a writer than anything else in my opinion. I remember him talking about how he always has this unique perspective of wanting to write the lyrics for his songs before starting on any of the melodies for them. He views it as a way to trap yourself in a box in terms of what you can write. Because if you decide on the melody first, you have to apply the words and make that work. And I'm personally very grateful for it if it means we get songs with so much attention to detail. And I think that's what his audience sees when they listen to his music. They don't see music created by a corporation. They see music made by a man and woman passionate about what they do. And what kind of relationship is that really? You would think it would be one where a creator actively reaches out to their audience, by constantly involving them in what they do, right? But you would be dead wrong. The success of Yorochika comes from how they reject that popularity. So when I was researching this video, I actually had the opportunity to read the 50 page journal that Nabuna made for Alma, thanks to They Lead Shadows translation. But one name that I didn't recognize that kept coming up was this guy named Henry Dagger. It wasn't just here either. Even in interviews, Nabuna brought this man's name up, and named him as an influence. So naturally, I started to dive in, and this is where things get kinda weird. Henry Dagger was an artist who rose to fame during the 1970s in the US. His most famous work being the story of the Vivian Girls, a piece of work that was over 15,000 pages long. Focusing on seven young girls fighting for the freedom of children everywhere who had been forced into slavery by the Gwendolinians. Henry was a gifted artist, but the art that he made for his work is honestly hard to look at. I know for me at least seeing paintings of young girls being attacked is extremely uncomfortable. But for Henry, this serves as a form of self-escape as he suffered a tragic childhood of abuse. He made three attempts to escape his orphanage growing up before finally seceding and fleeing to Chicago. But on the plus side, today his work sells for hundreds of thousands of dollars. The thing is though, Henry was never a famous author or even a famous painter. He was a reclusive hospital janitor and dishwasher. Now if that sounds par for the course for you for a famous artist, then yeah, you're not wrong. But what made Henry Dagger stand out was that he was what we call an outside artist. He was self-taught and had very little contact with the mainstream art world during his life. On top of that, we really don't know much about his life besides what he left behind for us in his work. And that's because through the course of his life, he made his work in secret from his apartment during his free time. And unlike many artists, he never tried to publish any of it. In fact, towards the end of his life, he told his landlord to toss out his work instead of publishing it. And I think there's an element of Nabuna who's pursuing to be Henry Dagger. The inspiration for That's Why I Gave Up On Music came from an inner conflict that Nabuna had. 
to make music where he doesn't have to rely on an audience to see his work, to make art for the sake of making art. But on the other hand, there's another part of him who is actively contradicting himself by deciding to make music his living. And so in his mind, he has come to the point of quitting music, the guilt of using art to make a profit. Now, since then, Nabuna has changed his mindset. He's of course grateful and attached to the opportunities that Yoroshika has given him. And he's glad to have someone like Sui around as a partner who can sing his music with such raw emotion. But despite that, I still think there's a part of Nabuna holding onto that desire to be an outside artist, or at the very least, not to be thought of in his work. Both him and Sui have now famously chosen to keep their identities from the public, so their audience can listen to their music without preconceptions. The reality of the matter is that Nabuna has no real connection with what's going on with his audience, and he tries not to. In fact, when he was asked why he thought so many young people found their place in his work, he had to turn the question to Sui, because he legitimately had no idea why. He's simply just making his own work for his own sake. I think some of you might find that repulsive or even stuck up. Like, wow, he cares nothing about us. But in my eyes, it's the complete opposite. It's a man trying to sacrifice himself for the sake of his work. And because he keeps his mindset, he avoids pandering to his audience. And the result are songs and lyrics that feel genuine and unique. Not something that feels like it was made by seven co-writers getting paid millions of dollars in a studio. And so it's almost like Nabuna is handing over his work so it could become ours. So we can turn it into anything that we want it to be. I'll leave you with this quote that I took from one of his interviews. So no matter how much of my life is reflected in my work, I want you to see my work in a way that does not involve the existence of me in it. I want to receive an evaluation only seeing the work. Thanks for watching.